everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Stagner. Today we're going to be talking about aortic and cardiac emergencies. I'm director of vascular CT and MRI. Um, this is a couple example images that we have here. Okay. First, we'll start off with some content organization. So we'll review the anatomy of the aortic root. We'll have a look at different imaging techniques, gated versus ungated scans. Then we'll review some specific aortic emergencies, and then we'll do some cardiac emergencies as well. So um, for content recognition, so um, three of my awesome fellows, Mukta, Sandeep, and Beth Ripley, um, helped put these images together with cases from both me and Ron, and we won a certificate of merit at RSNA a couple years ago with, with this content. So first, let's start with the anatomy. So here we have the aortic root. So the aortic root is the anatomic segment between the left ventricle and the ascending aorta. We try to be very specific when, when talking about the aortic root because it, different people can think of anything in this area as the aortic root. Um, but for measurements, the annulus is what is referred to as the aortic root. We try not to use the word the aortic root measures X in our studies because some people that could mean the ascending aorta or it could mean all the way down to the annulus or the sinuses of Valsalva. So we're very specific where where we take our measurements and the words that we use. But it's important to be aware that um, people believe that this entire area is the aortic root. So when they're talking about the aortic root, it can be anything in this area, not just the specific level that we think about as the annulus for the measurements. So the aortic annulus, the cusps, the sinuses, the STJ are all components and they function together as a unit. So here's the annular plane, um, which is the measurement that's, that defines the aortic root. Um, here's the sinotubular junction. And then here we have the sinuses of Valsalva in between. And the lowest part of the sinus of Valsalva is called the nadir. Um, and nadir is just a fancy word for the lowest point, one of these medical words that you only learn in, in, in medicine. Um, the, the nadir is the point where we want to be one slice below that when we do our measurements when we're doing TABR. So for our annulus measurement, we, we look for the nadir of each cusp. Okay, so let's review the anatomy. So the aortic annulus is a fiber structure that attaches the aortic root to the left ventricle. So here we see the, this is the LVOT here. We have the ascending aorta, left atrium, left ventricle, pulmonary artery, sinotubular junction here is where the tubular part of the aorta meets the sinuses of Valsalva. So in healthy individuals, the aortic root is directly anterior to the left atrium. So in this space here, so we should have no soft tissue in this space. So we, we wanna make sure that we can clear this space in all patients where we're concerned about um, issues of the aortic root. So here we have the ascending aorta, left ventricle, pulmonary artery, left atrium, descending aorta. So here's that retroaortic space. This is also the space where if we have a retroaortic coronary artery, we'll also travel through that space. This is also the pathway if you have a sino atrial nodal branch that comes off the circumflex, it will also traverse this space. But nothing else should live in that space. You should just have periaortic fat, which is black, like what we have here. And the walls are a brighter shade of gray because they're more dense than the fat. This space is enlarged when we have an abscess. So we have pus in that space and we'll show examples of that. So let's review these anatomical locations on both gated and ungated CT. So we'll start with the left atrial appendage. Um, it's very important to, to know how to recognize these structures on ungated CTs because most of the patients that come in through EDs, through the emergency room, their scans are gonna be ungated, especially if they come from outside hospitals um, or they typically won't have a dual energy scanner like we have an RED where we can do a flash protocol, which is almost as good as gating. So we have to get used to dealing with these images on the bottom. So let's review what the left atrial appendage should look like when we have no motion and what it looks like when we do have motion. So now we have the ascending and the descending aorta. And notice that we do see typical pulsation artifact and it'll be in the orientation of the pulsation. So if we had to measure the aorta here, we wouldn't measure from here to here, we would measure in this direction if we had to measure because we don't want to measure the motion. 
Here's the ascending aorta. As we get further down, so closer to the aortic root, there's more motion. The higher you go up in the aorta, so once we get to the aortic arch, we typically don't see as much pulsation, but you can still have pulsation in the aortic arch. Don't really see pulsation in the descending aorta. You can have it in young patients, um, but we don't really see it here. Next, the pulmonary artery. So here we see the pulmonary artery without motion. Here we see the pulmonary artery with mo motion. So we have this double shadow. Here's the right ventricular outflow tract. Just important to recognize the difference between that and the pulmonary artery where the pulmonic valve lives. The left atrium is the most posterior chamber of the heart. So we see the left atrium here. So the next posterior structure is gonna be the aorta, vascular structure that is. Next, we have the right ventricle. The right ventricle is the most anterior structure of the heart. So if the patient um, was at risk for a stab wound or a puncture injury directly through the sternum, the first chamber that they would hit would be the, the right ventricle. Um, Sarah Cuddy has a fantastic case of a patient that got stabbed um, with um, a hole in their heart through the septum um, that survived, which is pretty an amazing, amazing cardiac CT case that she has there. Next is the right atrium. So the right atrium um, accepts blood from the SVC, the IVC, and also the coronary sinus. Um, and it can look, have quite variable appearances because we have mixing contrast coming in the right atrium. When we inject the contrast comes in from above in the SVC, because we typically inject through the arms, we have unopacified blood coming up from the IVC and that mixing can cause artifacts um, in the right atrium. So it's important to be aware of the phase of contrast that you're in when evaluating right atrial structures. Here we have the LV. So the LV um, is surrounded by the thick myocardium. So it should be easy to identify the left ventricle. Um, is the biggest chamber of the heart that we see and surrounded by thick muscle. Next, we have the right atrial appendage. The right atrial appendage um, is important because it can mimic a dissection flap, potentially. Okay. And the SVC, here we have the SVC coming down on ungated scans. Again, we can see a lot of motion and mixing artifact in the SVC. Okay. So I know it's hard to stay awake because it's um, right about lunchtime, but this is my son trying to stay awake and on a Trader Joe's run. He's, this is when he was about three. He's, he's 10 now, but I still love that movie. <laughs> oh, that was great. Okay, so let's go into some of the cases. So case number one, uh, we have a 75 year old male with shortness of breath and severe aortic stenosis. A pulmonary artery CT was performed, which was negative for PECT. But if we take a closer look here, um, we have streak artifact coming from the sternal wires and coming from the bypass graft clips. Patient is post cabbage here. And we see streak artifact in the ascending aorta. But there's another finding if we look closely, um, with th this line that's coming in this direction doesn't really make sense with the other streak artifact, this line here. So the recommendation was to repeat the study with proper contrast timing and gating. So this is time for the pulmonary artery. So not really time for the aorta, but there is enough contrast in the aorta to make the finding that we see there, but it's easier with proper timing and gating. So now we have no motion. We have the contrast in the right part. And we see that there was a dissection flap that was missed on this outside scan. Um, where scanned properly, we can, we can make the diagnosis. So if you have a patient that's high risk for a dissection and they are, their aorta has been touched by surgery, we need to do that as a gated study, not a non-gated study. And that, and the, also we have to time the contrast for the aorta. So this was missed due to the streak artifact and poor timing. Next case, we have a 55 year old female with history of metastatic ovarian cancer, status post-surgery and chemotherapy had MSSA sepsis from infected left knee, status post washout, had a purulent pericardial effusion that was also washed out with pericardiocentesis in a drain, presents with multiple pulmonary lesions concerning for septic emboli versus metastatic disease. Contrast enhanced CT was ordered. So what do we see on the contrast CC, CT? We see bilateral patchy ground glass opacities. These are likely septic emboli. On the contrast enhanced CT, we see this finding here below the pulmonary artery. So we shouldn't really have an extra structure um, beneath the pulmonary artery there. So this is an aortic root pseudoaneurysm. If we measure the pericardial fluid, 
it's hyperdense. So we can actually see some enhancements of the pericardium here where we can separate the fluid from the walls of the pericardium. Patient also had a moderate left pleural effusion, but this, this finding was missed, so the patient was managed medically. So follow-up, um, non-gated diagnostic CT, patient came again um, with chest pain a month, a month later, and we see that there's been interval increase in size of our pseudoaneurysm at the root of the aorta that was missed on the prior study. So again, we shouldn't have anything below the pulmonary artery here. Um, so this, is, this should not be here. Patient underwent emergency surgery for pseudoaneurysm repair. Next case, we have a 33-year-old, so a young male with history of infectious endocarditis and IV drug abuse, status post bovine arch, bovine aortic valve replacement, one year prior, presents with fever. So if we look here, we have a, a coronary artery CT scan. So here's our aorta, here's our left atrium, our most post posterior chamber of the heart. Here's the left main coronary artery, which looks like it's getting squeezed and it's surrounded by this low density material. Remember when we looked at the, the normal study and we looked at the retroaortic space in the left atrium, we weren't expecting to see anything in that space. Here we see expansion of that space. So now um, patient has a large periaortic root abscess causing mass effect on adjacent structures. So we can see all of this is abscess. It's even compressing the left main coronary artery here. Here's a 3D rendering um, showing the narrowing of the left main coronary artery. You can see that also here on the long axis view um, for the comparison. You see the short axis, we see the small dot. And then we see the, see the pseudoaneurysm here also on the 3D. So here's the valve plane. We see what looks like a sinus of valsalva is actually a pseudoaneurysm coming up, extending up from the valve plane that we have here. Patient underwent surgery with aortic valve re-replacement, aortic root and aortoventricular reconstruction, returned six month follow-up chest CT exam. And what do we see again? We see a large subvalvular leak. So again, there shouldn't be anything below the pulmonary artery here on the coronal image. And we see all of this is this large paravalvular leak. Um, here we see the hole, right here is the direct hole um, in the LVOT. And we see all of this is, is pseudoaneurysm with mass effect on the left atrium. The left atrium is being compressed here. Okay, so let's switch gears. So case number four, we have a 60 year old male with acute chest and back pain. We see a contrast enhanced CT scan. We have axial, coronal and sagittal image here. So first thing that we notice, we see a crescent shaped hyperdensity consistent with intramural hematoma. There's also focal intramural pooling of contrast that we see here on the descending aorta, um, which can be mistaken for dissection or aortic root pseudoaneurysm, but this is contained within the wall of the aorta. So although typical routine chest imaging does not include unenhanced images and hyperdensity in the aortic wall is better appreciated on unenhanced images, it should be acquired whenever in doubt. The uniform crescent shape is the hallmark feature of intramural blood pools, so we don't need the I minus to make this diagnosis. And that's the point of this slide. Um, the initial sign was um, named the Chinese ring sword sign, arguably the coolest sign in radiology. Um, I think it looks really cool here actually with the rings on the sword. And these are all branch artery pseudoaneurysms that are contained within the wall of the aorta. So if we look at the um, pathology of what's happening here, so this was all done by an interventional radiology group where they followed patients over seven years and they actually cannulated these to show the findings. So we see here, this is a normal aorta um, and this is a normal branch artery. And what happens whenever we have a, a dissection or an intramural hematoma actually, we dissect the wall. So we have an intramedial hemorrhage. So hemorrhage in the wall of the aorta that's dissecting across. Once it gets to the ostium of that branch artery, it'll tear that ostium and we're left with a pseudoaneurysm that can balloon out but it, it stays contained within the wall of the aorta. To prove this, this vascular interventional radiology group um, cannulated these and then injected them in the cath lab. So we can see that this is actually contained in the wall of the aorta and it's part of the intercostal network. They weren't sure if this um, connoted a worse prognosis for the patient. So they followed patients for seven years and they, they found that the patients um, did not do worse if they had that finding. 
This is what it looks like over time. So we have residual intramural blood pool. Here we see it here in the descending aorta. And over time, the rest of the IMH, so all the IMH is, has resorbed here and remodeled. And so now the aorta is trying to get back to normal, but now we have systemic pressure in this branch artery pseudoaneurysm. So even though it's gotten smaller, it hasn't completely gone away. Another feature of the intramural hematoma is what's called the ulcer-like projection. So we only really use this term in the setting of intramural hematoma. And what we see is a focal defect in the wall, which people believe is actual, just, actually just a focal dissection in the, in the intima right there. It's important to monitor this area on follow-up studies. The, what happens is that this can progress um, to a larger saccular aneurysm. This is one example of that. Here's another example. Here we have the um, small ulcer-like projection. And then on the follow-up study, um, it turned into this saccular aneurysm that we see here. Here's a companion case. So this is a patient um, outside study. This is actually from the Cape. So the patient got scanned and we see here, we see a, a crescent-shaped hyperdensity that goes around the aortic arch and continues down the ascending aorta. So this is a type A IMH. Patient was referred to the Brigham. So patient gets transferred to the Brigham. We repeat the study in our institution because that's what we do. We see here, what happened to our crescentic rim of hyperdensity? It's now gone. Hmm, where did it go? So we, we did, so this is our I minus scan. So here's the I plus scan. I'll pause it and then scroll through it just to show you. So here we still have our crescentic rim, um, but it's hypodense relative to the contrast. So this was not recognized of, as the IMH uh, and the radiologists talked themselves out of it because they did not see hyperdensity on the I minus scan, but it's perfectly smooth, it's crescentic. The differential that was given was that this was atheroma actually. And this certainly does not look like atheroma. It's way too smooth. It's perfectly smooth actually. Atheroma is not smooth. It's a process of the intima. This is a process of the media. So the intima is intact. So it's nice and smooth, but it was still miscalled and delayed the diagnosis. So we repeat the study. If we look at the, actually, if we look at the Hounsfield units of the repeat study, we see that the blood pool is still pretty high relative to the IMH. So if we look at the timing, um, we see here that the, 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 the four hours post contrast of our repeat scan was enough to still keep the Hounsford units high. So the patient had normal renal function and took a normal bolus of contrast and the Hounsford units were still elevated in the blood pool, which was not expected. And that was the pitfall in this case, was that we used relative versus absolute attenuation. We waited 24 hours. We actually repeated the study because I believe this to be an IMH and we did a gated um, I minus. We can see here now that the blood pool is back down to normal and we can see the difference between the blood pool and the hyperdense rim now. We repeat the I minus gated. So we can now see that this crescentic rim um, extends into the ascending aorta just like it did on the I plus scan. So be, be careful of that. So case number five, um, so we move on here. So we have a 69 year old female with chest pain. So here we see a type A dissection um, involving the ascending aorta. Here we see on the coronal, we see the dissection flap here with extension of contrast with two lumens, the true lumen and the false lumen. We see actually see active extravasation of contrast. Um, and this is one of the only cases that I have of active extravasation of contrast from the aorta. Those patients typically don't last very long. In fact, they don't last, they don't make it to imaging um, or they don't make it to the hospital to even get the imaging. Or the ones that do, um, they, they die pretty quickly afterwards. Here we see compression of the left atrium actually um, from this IMH. Also the pulmonary artery is compressed. The pulmonary artery should be round. Here we see that it's um, flattened by this pseudoaneurysm um, that's sticking out of the aorta. So why do type A's benefit from surgery? Um, so it, we have to think about where is the pericardial reflection? Um, the surgery that patients get from a type A is they get an, an interposition graft of the ascending aorta. So the complications that kill people from type A's is dissection flap, um, rupturing, uh, rupture aorta, so hemopericardium, rupture or death from hemopericardium, extension of the dissection flap into the coronary artery, and then an MI, death from MI, 
extension of the dissection flap into the valve um, with acute um, severe AI, and patients can die from that. So if we replace this ascending aorta with a, with a tube, a Dacron tube, then that mitigates those three potential complications. Here's an example of a type A. We see ruptured um, hemopericardium here. We see the crescentic rim um, of hyperdensity. Um, here's a case that was misdiagnosed. Um, so we see here in the axial images, we see here a crazy flap. Look, looks like it's in the, it stays in the arch, but then we come down, we see, is that the aortic valve there or is that something else? So let's take another look here. So we see here on the coronal. So the mistake that was made in this case was that people mistakenly thought this was the aortic valve and that this was the dissection flap. And what we have here is a complete dissection through and through where we have this section of the, the aorta, we have a discontinuous flap. I'll show it to you again here on the sagittal. We're here, it looks like this is gonna be the aortic valve, but it's not. Here's an example on 3D. It shows you the extent of the dissection flap. And then we reformatted short axis. And I know in the ED, they don't have time to reformat in short axis, but it would definitely help in this case to separate out what's valve and we see no flap here. And then the flap starts back up again um, in the proximal or the postvascular aortic arch, prevascular aortic arch, sorry. Here we see the flap there. So circumferential type A dissection with flap discontinuity. Um, next case, we have a 75 year old with history of stroke. Here we see on the, um, the, the neck CT, so this is a, a head and neck CTA, we see that there's a dissection on the neck CT, and even though it's not gated, and the patient's arms will be down, so we'll have a, expect to have a lot of noise in the aortic arch on a neck CT, they still were able to make the diagnosis here, and they recommended a proper gated aortic CTA. Um, so let's talk about the aortic arch. What about the aortic arch? So unfortunately, when we, um, the Stanford classification that classifies aortic dissections in the type A's and type B's, they said the type A's involved the ascending aorta, type B's involved the descending aorta. They didn't really say what to do with arches. Um, so there's been a reclassification. So in the radiology literature, and this has been a few years ago now, we reclassify arch dissections as to a type B's with um, involvement of the arch, which is the asterisk. And that's to make all the old radiologists um, feel better about calling it a, um, not calling it a type A. As radiologists being conservative in nature, we're gonna take every, if they didn't say what to do with the arch, well, we're just gonna assume that that's type A. And that's wrong because that's, that patients will not qualify for the same surgery that you would do for a type A. And that, that's the difference. Okay. Next case, we have a 73-year-old female, post-op day nine from an ascending aortic graft repair with shortness of breath. Pulmonary CTA is suspected for pulmonary embolism. So here we see in the aorta, even though this was time for a pulmonary artery study and the contrast is in the pulmonary artery, we do have enough contrast in the aorta to evaluate the aorta and make a diagnosis. We see this focal outpouching. Um, there was suspected a hemopericardium from the graft leak. So they um, consulted vascular radiology to have a second look. So vascular radiology took a second look. And this is consistent with a normal post-op appearance. So how could this be normal? Well, let's take a look at the aortic arch graft repairs. So we do cardiopulmonary bypass to do a lot of these surgical procedures. So venous and arterial axis cannula are placed to drain the deoxygenated blood into the cardiopulmonary bypass machine then we have to return it back to systemic circulation. There's an arterial perfusion cannula that's placed through a graft side branch to allow systemic integrated flow while they're doing the anastomoses. When they're done with the um, integrated systemic flow, they no longer need this graft. So then they will over -sew the graft. And that can mimic a pseudoaneurysm. So if you're not aware that that's part of the normal surgical appearance, then you would have to call that a pseudoaneurysm. The important thing is to notice where the suture line is and that this is in part of the graft. So it's important to get access to that surgical report and that can be difficult if the patient presents to an outside ED where they're not gonna have their history or their surgery and you may not also have a vascular radiologist there. Um, 
And these patients sometimes actually get transferred to us to evaluate this finding from outside studies. So here, a month later, patient presented with nonspecific chest pain, CTHS was uh, obtained. You can see, sorry. Let's see if I can skip over to the next slide. Okay, so smooth, well-defined outpouching from the, uh, from the ACE aneura. You can see that the, the amount of post-surgical fluid has decreased after. So there's an interval decrease in the, in the post-surgical appearance there. Okay, case number nine, we have a 69-year-old male with a history of an ACE aneurysm graft repair for type A dissection two years ago with chest pain. So two years ago, we shouldn't expect to have fluid around the stump or around the graft repair, that should all go away. So what we notice is a smooth outpouching from the proximal graft repair consistent with our perfusion port. So that's normal, we expect to see that, but we see another small outpouching adjacent to the stump. Now, in the older graft repairs, they used to add this perfusion port in, so they had to sew it in, and that opens this up as a potential, um, lo a potential location to have a pseudoaneurysm. Anywhere where you have a graft anastomosis, you have a potential to have a pseudoaneurysm. That can happen from infection or it can happen spontaneously. Um, what we see here is there is a loculated anterior hyperdense pericardial effusion. So this is concerning this effusion, that it's this big, this far post-op. So what, what the finding is here is we have an aortic pseudoaneurysm arising from the aortic cannulation site because they created this cannula into the graft. This was not part of the graft. Um, and that's important to know um, in the surgical history, um, but this can be a potentially fatal complication. Um, infections do predispose you to pseudoaneurysm formation, but we're looking for a saccular outpouching um, with, a, with a narrow neck, typically at the cannulation site. We're looking for periaortic soft tissue stranding also and edema, and that should gradually go down um, from the surgery date, and it should not persist um, months or even years later. We can also have periaortic gas, which is a late finding. Aortic pseudoaneurysms are running from the aortic cannulation site. It's important to do I minus studies. So if you're gonna do a dissection protocol, you all, always wanna do, or any aortic imaging in these patients, we wanna look pre-contrast so we can identify all of the surg surgical material. So we see that we can differentiate them from normal pledgets, pledgets with a non-contrast CT. So all of this bright material is all surgical material. They are hyperattenuating. Um, unfortunately, they can be as bright as contrast material, um, which can make it very challenging when the pseudoaneurysms are the same density as the pledges. So that's why we have to have the I minus in these cases. Here we can see this is another big pseudoaneurysm coming from the, the, the suture site. Here's a bonus case. This is a 70 year old male with recent history of shortness of breath over two months. Echo showed a right atrial possible lesion and history of a remote dissection repair with further history was about 10 years prior. So I got called from the um, MR suite to come look at these images immediately from the MR scanner. And we see um, a couple findings here, but the first thing that we notice, so here's a sagittal just localizer um, and we see a, a huge um, mass at the level of the aortic root. It looks like it has flow in it. So we did a stack through it. So the functional stack, and we see this is large pseudoaneurysm that's centered on the aortic valve. So the, the assumption here is that this is gonna be a, a post-op pseudoaneurysm centered at the valve plane. So as we're coming up through it, we start to see this huge mass. Here's the valve. We see the susceptibility artifact from the metal in the valve. We see it's continuous here with the ascending aorta. And we see the dissection, actually the residual type B dissection. Here's more images from the case. So we did an MRA here. So I'll just pause it and scroll it. And we can see the pseudoaneurysm coming right off of the valve plane. There's also down here is a paravalvular leak. So this is below the valve. Here's the axial image. As we go down, we see our dissection. 
So here's true lumen. This is thrombose false lumen with pseudoaneurysm now. As we come down, see this was, a, this was that paravabular leak more inferiorly around the valve. Here we did a CT, full core press. And the CT was done more for surgical planning actually. So we could really understand what was going on with the valve. And we see here, here's that paravabular leak from the LVOT um, that we showed a case like this in conference actually this morning. Very similar case here with the hissence of the valve. There's the paravabular leak going around the valve there. Here we can see it again on the coronal projection right here. This looks almost exactly the same as the case that we showed in conference as far as the dehiscence of the valve and the paravabular leak. Unfortunately, this patient did not survive the surgery, which is a major bummer. But you have to go to the OR when you see an aorta that looked like this. His symptoms were shortness of breath because of the paravabular leak. That was the cause of his symptoms, not actually the, the aneurysm itself. Okay, moving on. So this is an interesting case. So my older brother is a radiologist in small town, Louisiana, um, but they have a huge cardiology practice there that does sort of um, um, emerging procedures. So um, he sent me this case to show and see if anybody had seen this before. I certainly hadn't. But if we look at the plain film here, so we see that there's a patient's had cabbage, um, patient has an AICD, but we see some other leads here. Maybe this is an epicardial pacing of some sort. And then there's another finding that we see, we see air in a space that should be where the asymmetry is, but it's not a place you really wanna see air. So if we take a look at the CT images. We see that there's air in association with the asymmetry. What, this is really bizarre. But if you look closely, it looks like there's a tube connected to this. You see this cannula here? So this is an extra aortic balloon pump. And I don't think this technology survived but it was an experimental technology. It was called the C-pulse. So the idea here was to wrap this balloon around the ascending aorta so you wouldn't have to go to surgery here um, or to put them on bypass to do this. So we wrapped this around the ascending aorta with the idea to increase the afterload pressure. So during diastole, this thing would pump up and increase the, the basically the coronary filling pressure is the idea with this balloon pump. So I thought it was interesting that that my, my brother had seen this in small town, Louisiana, and we're at one of the biggest cardiovascular sites in the, in the world, and I, I hadn't heard of it. So I figured I would share it with the group. Okay, so here's another case. We have a 73-year-old male status post cath for chest pain with severe aortic stenosis. And then they were transferred to the Brigham for uh, TAVR evaluation or aortic valve replacement and slash TAVR. So let's see here, we have a non-contrast CT. So if we look at the Ascending aorta for IMH, we we'll wanna look at that first. Don't see any crescentic rim of hyperdensity. The size of the aorta also looks normal. Let's look at the descending aorta. What? We see something in the descending aorta that has streak artifact around it. So it's too dense to be um, cortical bone or calcium because it's more dense than the streak. Well, let's take a look at this on 3D. So this is the retained guide wire from the cardiac cath. Whoops, but there was no mention of this. This wasn't described in the patient's procedure. So um, it's kind of bizarre that they didn't even know that this was just sitting in the patient's uh, descending aorta. Okay, I have another case, case um, 12. So we have a 75 year old female with a history of trauma, fall with acute chest pain, outside interpretation suggested traumatic aortic injury. So let's take a look and see what we see. So we have three different phases of contrast here. We have a sort of a pulmonary artery or a right-sided phase. Then we have a left-sided phase for the aorta. Then we have a delayed phase. So if we look at our, if we look at our images, um, we can see that there's a small outpouching from the right atrial appendage here, maybe with a little focus of hematoma right next to it, surrounded by that hyperdense fluid. So here we have a right atrial appendage pseudoaneurysm, which is very rare. Um, this is the only one that, that we've seen or anybody had seen actually here. And the idea was that the pressure of the right atrial appendage is really low, that they could manage this conservatively. And the patient did fine on um, conservative management. 
Next case, we have a 64-year-old female with atypical chest pain. So if we look, we have a contrast-enhanced CT. We see that there's a focal ballooning of the left ventricular apex. We also see the patient has massive MAC, and we have coronary artery disease. We have calcium there. Let's focus on the, we see some thinning and ballooning of the apex. And then looks like we may have a filling defect in the apex. So we have a filling defect in the aneurysmal LV apex. LV thrombus is a consequence of stagnant blood from poorly functioning segment of the myocardium. So patients treated with anticoagulation. So for the radiologist or any of the imagers, um, we always have to check the LV apex and the LV append in the left atrial appendage for thrombus in all patients in all scans, whether that's the point of the scan or not, because you could potentially save the patient from having a stroke. Here's another patient. So we have a 69 year old male with prosthetic aortic valve intercarditis. So gated CTA shows increased soft tissue between the aortic root and the left ventricle. So same thing, we shouldn't have anything in this retroaortic space concerning for aortic root abscess. There's also some motion indicated by the blue arrow. So they weren't sure if this was motion or this was a real finding. So we, re we did some ECG editing actually, and the motion artifact was eliminating, showing that this abscess was um, extending through the aortic wall. And we have this sort of protrusion of, uh, of abscess tissue here um, hanging into the left atrium. So it's important to identify cardiac motion that can be fixed with ECG gating um, to, to be able to not miss an important finding that you would see with the gating. Case 15, we have a 32-year-old male status post bivad with fever presents with a complex pericardial effusion. So here we see um, different densities in the pericardial fluid. We see pockets of gas, actually. We see pericardial enhancement. So, the so we have a bivad pocket infection with pericardial infection. Patient was taken back to surgery for debridement and bivalve replacement. Next case, we have a 40-year-old male with a LVAD, so a HeartMate 2 type of LVAD with recent device alarm. So we, if we look at the plain film images here, we notice that the bend relief is disconnected from the outflow elbow. So this top hat, it looks like a top hat is in this, you'd imagine this is the person, patient's head. This top hat has to be completely seated down on the patient's head. So this thing actually snaps on um, and can become disconnected. So let's review this. And our, all of our knowledge from this come from, came from Dr. Greg Cooper, who was a, a surgeon here um, years ago, who actually helped um, with the design of some of the features of this device. So he actually came down to the reading room one day with the device in hand and showed it to us how this thing snaps on um, and how when it comes disconnected, it becomes really sharp and can actually tear the, um, the Dacron graph. So here's an example of it here from the paper that we did. So here is the, the disconnected um, bend relief here. Here we see the inner Dacron tube. So, and this metal is actually really sharp. Um, he had us feel it to feel how sharp it was. And so it, you can easily, the corner of this can easily tear this Dacron tube. So what they had, and this, so this thing could spontaneously just pop off. And that happened actually in like about 20% of the patients, I think. So they designed, I think Greg actually designed this collar that they had to retrofit. So they brought all the patients back and put this locking collar on so that it couldn't come off. Here's an example of the different appearances that you can see. And we still have patients with heart made twos out there. Um, I can't guarantee that they've all had the locking collar in place, especially if they come from other institutions. But this is different levels of disconnect that we can see. Um, so here we see this is what it should look like, completely seated here. Here it's completely disconnected. Um, and here is different levels of disconnection. So here it's, it's in the right orientation, but it's not all the way down like it is here. Here you can actually see it's angulated. So it should be coaxial. So this plane should be the same as this plane. You shouldn't be able to make an angle here. This is ba basically the exact same findings on CT. Um, here is the, uh, the surgical example of our case, so the image from the OR. And here's the images on the 3D, where you can see the bend relief is disconnected from the, from the outflow elbow there. 
and Alfonso and Ruth were the ones that put this paper together. I have another case uh, of a VAD. So here's, an, here's a bivad. So case 17, 55 year old male status post bivad with chest pain. So if we look here, we see the, the bivad. So we have the different components going into the pulmonary artery, um, the right atrium, the LV, and then coming back up, if we look at the aortic sinus, looks like we have a lot of stuff there that shouldn't really be there. So here we have um, aortic root thrombosis. So one of the problems here was we're bypassing the aortic valve, right? So there's not a lot of flow that's going through the aortic valve. So the stagnant blood can lead to thrombosis. The thrombosis extends into both coronary ostea and the patient had MI um, from this, as you, can, as you can imagine here with the extension into both coronary. So here's the left main completely thrombosed. And here's the right, we see partial thrombosis of the right. So follow up patient now. Um, so patient did, they were able to extract all the thrombus. Um, patient did suffer some um, residual effects from the MI, but is still, still kicking. So we still have, now we have severe AI now um, as a consequence. So what do they do to fix the severe AI? Huh, well, it looks like they did something there. Let's take a look at this coronal. Well, they put an amplatzer across it is what they did. So this is what an amplatzer across the aortic valve looks like on 3D. So pretty cool. So if patient ever makes it off of the, off of the VAD, obviously they'd have to have the aortic, aortic root and valve replaced. So here's a bonus case. Um, so here's a, a, another thing that we look for in VADs. And this happens mostly with heart made twos, doesn't really happen with heart mate threes or heart wares. Those two devices live in the pericardial space and the, the left ventricular cannulation can be moved um, to a better position. In the heart mate two, it can only be moved a little bit because it's a massive device. So what can happen is that it can be angulated towards one of the walls. Here it's angulated towards the septum. This is a three chamber view. So this is the anteroseptal wall. Um, and you can see that the, the myocardium is being sucked into the LVAD um, throughout the, the cardiac cycle here. And how does that look on 4D? So this is a surgeon's view. So looking from the left atrium um, back into the, into the LV, this is the left ventricular outflow tract and here's the aorta. So we're looking down the LV apex is down here. And what we notice is that we see that that wall is coming down on top and closing off the inflow cannula. Okay, next case, case 18. This is a 23 year old male status post IVC filter placement with fracture upon attempted removal. Um, the Brigham is a site that um, likes to remove IVC filters that have been complicated or have been in for a long time and need to come out. So we're a place that does this. Therefore, we're gonna see frequent complications from this. So we see on the non-contrast chest of the uh, CT scan of the heart, we see a hyperdense structure um, that seems to be moving around. This is without gating. So this is the embolized filter strut crossing the tricuspid valve. Here we see a re retained strut in the IVC. Next patient, we have a, a 56 year old male status post portacath placement. So if we look here, we see the port um, with the tip and the sort of uh, a little bit too low and probably in the, in the right atrium here actually. And we notice there's another hyperdense line that we see. So that was an embolized piece of the guide wire into the right pulmonary artery that was picked up on the portable chest that had to be um, re retrieved with a snare. Here we see it on the CT. And the problem with this is that um, this could skewer the pulmonary artery wall. You can end with a pulmonary artery pseudoaneurysm. Um, same thing can happen actually with a swan that's in that's too far, right? And if we look closely, we see, oh, there's another piece that was stuck in the RV. Next case, we have a 20 year old or 24 year old uh, male with history of IV drug abuse with fever. So we have a non contrast CT here. So this is a non gated CT and the finding was picked up. So we see here on the non gated CT, I'll direct your attention to the 
to this part of the right ventricle and we see streak artifact, um, and hyperdensity with a streak artifact, almost looks like a coronary calcium um, in a non-gated study that's sort of moving a lot. But this is not really in the area of the right coronary, it would be back here. So this is in the ventricle. So this was actually a needle that was embolized into the RV um, with, and there's also a big tricuspid vegetation that we can see there. So here's the tricuspid veg here, very thick. And then we see the, the needle embolization buried in the RV free wall. Next case here, we have an 84 year old um, female with history of vertebroplasty, now with chest pain. This is one of, one of my favorite cases. So here, as we scroll down, we direct your attention to the pulmonary artery. We see a hyperdense um, structure in the pulmonary artery, maybe with a little thrombus um, attached to it. Then if we look at the RV, we see another hyperdense structure now um, sticking into the RV and we have a pericardial effusion here. So what's going on? So um, if, you, if you look at the 3D image here, everything is purple is the methyl methacrylate cement that's used for the vertebroplasty. So we, if we look here below, we can see it's starting, it's extruding through the vein. And then we have embolization of material. So here we have embolization through the right ventricle. It actually skewers the right ventricle. So you, this is actually, it's sticking out to the right ventricle here. And that's what caused the hemopericardium and the chest pain. And also we have a piece that actually solidified when it was in the pulmonary artery to the point where they couldn't get it out um, Pram told me he had to fracture this thing to, to take it out of the patient's heart. Or actually, was sorry, Aranke told me that, not Pram. Um, so that was a, a really cool case there. So when you see it with rotation, actually, you can see how it's actually sticking through the free wall of the RV. So in conclusion, it's important to be aware of aortic and cardiac lesions. It's essential to help give the patient a chance um, at recovery if we identify these things early. On routine chest CT exams, cardiac motion affects precise delineation of the aortic root. In patients with suspected aortic root or cardiac pathology, gated studies are definitely recommended. It's important to have access to the op reports um, in comparison with non-contrast CT scan to help distinguish normal from abnormal post-op findings. And also remember to look at the heart if you're not a vascular radiologist, um, that we can, we can see more than, more than we realize. And thanks everybody for your attention. And sorry about the, the late start, but we actually finished early.